Welcome to Veteran Resource Podcast, where you will meet nonprofit organizations focused on improving the lives of veterans and their family members. Here is your host, Jeremy Paris. Welcome, everybody, to episode four of the Veteran Resource Podcast. Today's guest is Jamie Stacy from Code of Support Foundation. I was fortunate enough to work alongside Jamie during Code of Support Foundation's Spirit of 45 Day event this past year, where I was among the cast of Baltimore Telling, and we performed a shortened version of Baltimore Telling during that event. It was such a fun and inspiring day, and it was the first time that I had met Jamie in person. Now, before I get into the interview, I want to take a second to say thank you to all of you listeners. As you know, we launched this podcast last Wednesday, April 8th, and two days later, we hit number one in iTunes, new and noteworthy, under the category government and organizations. We hit number one under the subcategory national, and we also hit number one under the subcategory nonprofit. That is pretty huge. And between hitting number one And all of the incredible things that were said in the reviews on iTunes, as well as all of the things that people were telling me on Facebook, I think it's a pretty good indication that this podcast was greatly needed. So how did we hit number one in two days? Well, it was because of all of you who subscribed to this podcast, all of you who rated and reviewed this podcast, and all of you who shared this podcast over social media with all of your friends. In other words, you got us to number one, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And if you haven't rated and reviewed this podcast in iTunes, I invite you to do so. It will help more veterans to find this podcast when they search and find out about great veteran service organizations like Code of Support Foundation. Okay, let's get back to the interview. Beginning her time at Code of Support Foundation as an AmeriCorps VISTA, Jamie is now the Director of Partnerships and Integration. She directs and coordinates Code of Support Foundation's Warrior, Veteran, and Family Support Network and Partner Collaboration. Prior to joining the team, Jamie held positions in program development and coordination, research, advancement, and administrative support with organizations such as Siena College Academic Community Engagement, the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, and Interfaith Partnership for the Homeless. She has experience working in community development and engagement at both the macro and grassroots levels. Jamie holds an interdisciplinary degree with concentrations in business, communication, and Spanish from the Roberts Wesleyan College in Rochester, New York, and is a native of Averill Park, New York. She is honored and passionate to invest in strategies which better support the military family community. Let's jump right into the interview and listen to Jamie tell us all about the great things that Code of Support Foundation is doing. So welcome, Jamie, to the Veteran Resource Podcast. I'm pretty excited to have you on. This is kind of cool. I have had the opportunity to work with you in the past for when we did the excerpt of the Telling Project. Yeah, that that was a that was really really awesome when you guys came for that. So thanks for having me on. This is this is really exciting for me. Great honor. So Jamie, before we get into the Code of Support Foundation, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about you and your background. Can you tell me about where you grew up and what that was like? Yeah, so I grew up in a very small town in upstate New York, not anywhere close to New York City. I do get offended if people try and tell me that I'm anywhere close to New York City, um, (laughs) as was grounded into us growing up in that area. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I grew up around farmland and trees and windy roads that would get people sick if they weren't used to that area. Nice. Um, and I went to Averill Park High School and went all the way through the Averill Park school system, um, except for a couple of years when I was younger. I actually went to a Catholic school and was homeschooled and a, a private Christian school for a while. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I definitely, whenever I, uh, my mom went in for parent teacher conferences when I was a kid, the teacher always had to tell her, um, we needed to have Jamie sit up front because she asks a lot of questions and we have to be ready for that. And so (laughs) that's kind of been my MO, uh, since I was a kid is 
you know, if I don't understand something, I need to know the A, B, C, and D uh, before I can come to any sort of conclusions that I'm satisfied with. And uh, when when I was a kid also, especially this happened more in high school, when you would have to fill out those questionnaires of what do you want to do when you grow up? And looking back, it's embarrassing now, but <laughs> I used to say word for word, I know this is cliche, but I want to change the world. Awesome. <laughs> and so I, um, I went to, um, to college and ended up studying liberal arts. And it was really just because I, I guess, got so excited by ideas that I couldn't pick an actual skill or issue area to study because I was interested in all of them. Um, and thankfully, I had parents who who were really supportive and encouraging me uh, to be exploratory and, and to ask questions and, and to, you know, figure out where, where my passions really lie. That's great. So, uh, I, I did a little bit of research on you trying to find out as much as possible before the interview. I like to be prepared and, uh, I didn't find a whole lot of information about you on the internet, which, uh, which, which is probably good. Um, but I did find this really cool photo. It's uh, you with red eyes and some vampire teeth. Uh, it's a it's a really cool picture. <laughs> Do you want to uh, you want to tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. So um, I really that picture is I really attribute it to my to my friend Bethany Salvia, who is in marketing now uh, at a great company um, up in Boston. But she was my best friend growing up. We went to college together and she had just got a new camera. And so she was like, Jamie, let me, let me take a photo shoot. So I was like, all right. So going out, dancing around, posing. And she got this really awesome shot of the, the my wind or the hair kind of flowing my, or my, the wind, sorry, flowing my hair back. And uh, a couple of weeks later, she came to me and said, Hey, I've been playing around with my Photoshop. What do you think? And she had elongated my teeth. <laughs> dyed my eyes bright red and I already have red hair but she dyed it even brighter and then um pulled out my jawline so that I looked like the secret vampire that you couldn't you wouldn't necessarily notice if you looked at the picture very quickly <laughs> the reason it is online is because <laughs> a few days after that I got contacted from my college and they said hey you I don't even remember what the award was anymore it was some sort of award they wanted to post an article about me and then they wanted a picture. And <laughs> I don't know why I did this, but I decided it would be funny to submit that picture and see if anyone noticed. <laughs> no one noticed. It got published. Um, my mom called me up a few uh, weeks later and was like, Jamie, I've been, I'm so proud of you. I, I, I'm showing everyone your picture at work. I mean, it's such a beautiful shot. And I'm like, mom, did you notice anything about it? And she's like, well, you really need to get your IT shaved down. They're just too long. I can't believe I, I haven't taken you to the dentist before now. <laughs> and I was like, mom, I'm a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she was so mad at me. But ever since then, that picture lives in infamy <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> that is great. So I, I guess that is a, uh, a tribute to your friend's Photoshopping skills that uh, it, could fool, it could fool your own mother. Yeah. Yeah, they, it looks very real, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's really a cool shot with the uh, the very snowy New York background. <laughs> and that snow was real. I mean, there's a lot of snow up in New York, as you know. Even in the summertime. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Blood summer. <laughs> I'm from Buffalo, so yeah, I know snow. <laughs> so did you, uh, did you have any connection to the military growing up? <laughs> Uh, parents in the military or other relatives or uh, any friends or anything? Uh, so I had a couple uncles in the military. Um, but, you know, because what, which is typical of rural areas, there definitely was a lot of kids in my area that, that were interested. We were an hour from West Point. So my school always took us to, to the football games at West Point. We would cheer, you know, that was. And so I, I grew up wanting to join and being very interested in it. Uh, I, well, I, I, I honestly, West Point was probably one of the first places I thought about going when I was graduating high school. Um, and if not, I was going to do 
ROTC. Um, oh. But right towards the end of high school, the beginning of college, I actually got seriously injured playing soccer. I was a big soccer player. And so I, I couldn't, I couldn't even play soccer anymore. I was uh, redshirted out, out, you know, was able to keep my scholarship at college, but, but yeah, ended up not being able to do that. And so I still was very, very interested in the issue, even if I, in the issue area, even though I couldn't do anything about it myself. And I actually had ended up having a, a serious boyfriend in college that was a Marine and was deployed uh, for a lot of the time that I was in college. And so I really um, kind of got that experience of of what it was like to kind of be on the other end when you're you're not sure what's going on, you know. Right. And then when he came back, um, I definitely got to I I really saw some of the impacts that war had on him um, when he returned. And so during that time, you know, I was I was having to write. I was in a linguistics language and linguistics class in college, and we had to write a paper, um, like just about some sort of cultural gap in understanding and, and I am picking uh, cultural competence, uh, for service members. And so I spent much of my junior year of college studying that, that issue and kind of getting more engaged with it. And then, um, ultimately spending a semester, uh, interning at the center center for hemispheric defense studies at national defense university down in, in DC. And that, you know, I'm not, we're not in, in that re- relationship anymore, but I definitely owe a lot of my career to, to my, my ex-boyfriend who kind of really launched my interest in this area. And so <clears throat> when I graduated college, that was when I ended up finding Code of Support Foundation and just fell in love with the fact that it was, it was an organization that, that did just amazing work in uh, the veteran support space. And did it in a really innovative way. And, and as I said, you know, I love ideas and uh, adventures. And so uh, Code of Support has a really unique approach to the work that they do. And so I have, uh, you know, since I did a few things out after college, but since I moved down to D.C. from New York uh, two years ago, I've been working at Code of Support. That's quite the uh, the winding path that led you to Code of Support. It's like you you had all of these uh, stops along the way that kind of kept steering you towards assisting veterans through college, through your relationships, you know, your, your boyfriend. And even though you didn't end up in the military yourself, it seems like almost from the beginning, you, you were kind of helping to prepare yourself to for what you're doing right now with CODA support. Yeah, you know, it. you never quite know where you'll end up. But even just when you asked that question, I looked back and I really saw uh, how those pieces all kind of came together. And, and, you know, I should add that I, I couldn't be in the military, but what I ended up doing was becoming an AmeriCorps VISTA and serving on the civilian side for a year after college, which, you know, is a great alternative for someone who can't um, participate in military service. That's good. That's great. You, you still have that same service mentality. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, talk a little bit about code of support now. So you you said that you came on board uh, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, th- that actually I served at Code of Support. I, I did two terms of service as an AmeriCorps VISTA, but my second term was at Code of Support Foundation. And so I, I came on with them in fall of 2013. And then af- at the end of my term, I was hired on to to run the, a program that I was kind of helping to to build the foundation for as a Vista, which is the Warrior Veteran Family Support Network. So, so I I direct the, our Warrior Veteran Family Support Network and do a lot with our our partner relations and uh, and some community outreach, um, and and so yeah, I've been working there, um, doing some some really crazy exciting stuff with our three programs as kind of like the facilitator of those on behalf of the Warrior Veteran Family Support Network. That's great. So um, Code of Support, let's go into a little bit of of, uh, what it is. What is the Code of Support? So the Code of Support is actually, the foundation is is based on an actual document called the Code of Support. And it was was written by Major General Alan Salisbury, who is our founder. 
uh, and he with a, a couple of other flag officers, and he he wrote it as a parallel to the code of conduct that all Terry personnel uh, sign when they when they enter the service. And it was basically, you know, he he saw this this divide between the ninety nine percent, which is what people in in my space call civilian America, and the one percent which is our service members, veterans, and their families. And uh, he saw that that because we now have an all-volunteer force and, and we've been fighting one of the longest wars in history that's, that's causing multiple deployments and a whole host of unprecedented uh, challenges, that our, the civilian population is, is largely supportive of what's going on, but they're not necessarily involved because when we go to war, 1% of uh, the American population goes to war and the rest, um, you know, get to kind of not skirt the burden, but for lack of a better term, um, they don't, they don't have that burden. And so he, he kind of wrote the code of support as a call to action for civilian America. And, um, I can just read the first line because I think it's one of uh, it's really powerful. And it says, I am an American. I know that the men and women in our in our armed forces are prepared to give their lives to defend my country, my way of life and blessings of liberty throughout the world. I am committed to their perpetual recognition, appreciation and support. And so the, the rest of the six kind of just go into um, the, the ways and, and reasons to do that and uh and it's it's quite a powerful document. I mean, we we have it up on our website www.codeofsupport.org, and we really encourage people to sign it and then and then write a dedication to to why they're signing it or to to who. And that's also a way for us to stay connected and and help them not only say they'll get involved, but but actually do something about it. And I, I really love that about the uh, code of support document. You know, like you said, the ninety nine percent. There are many, many, many of them that really want to help. And a lot of times they don't know how to, so they don't really go out of their way to look for, well, what is it that I could or should be doing? And this kind of lays out, you know, that it's, it's your responsibility. And, uh, yeah. you know, people are signing, signing this document. How many uh, signatures do you have? Do you know offhand? Um, I don't. Uh that is actually a really great question. I would, I think we have around in the thousands. I'd ha- I, that is something I should check. Um, but yeah, I think we have in the thousands and, and you That's can actually great. go on and see them if you, if you look at our website and we always try and pull it out at our events and, and, you know, push it through social media and stuff. And it's really been a great platform for civilian America to take that first step into understanding, um, a, you know, what really is a whole different culture. I'll make sure that I put a, uh, a link to that in the show notes as well so that everybody can can go to the page and uh, not only see the code of support, but uh, they can they can sign it as well. That would be awesome. And and so, yeah, code of support, it was founded in, in 2010 by Major General Alan Salisbury and our executive director, Christy Kaufman, who was a military spouse for 11 years and became a military family advocate because of of all that she saw and experienced um, in her uh, during her time as a military spouse, and and so it it started from the code of support as an awareness and engagement campaign to to move people from caring to committed and involved. And for the first couple of years, that's what it was. They they ran events. They they created a documentary from going from the Pacific to the Potomac and interviewing different uh, service members and veterans and and kind of uh, passing the code of support through and. And then, and we still have that program. It's now called Education and Engagement, um, which is actually how Jeremy and I met through one of our, our events with that program. And then it kind of moved from there and grew into something that, you know, we still focus on civilian America. That is a gap. But there's a couple other gaps that we've seen that, that we've looked to fill into that, you know, I can get into when I, when I start to explain our different programs. Uh, yeah, speaking of that, going through your, your website, there's uh, one section that is called 99 Ways to Get Involved. And this is something that I thought was a great idea. And uh, whoever does your, your website, they need some props as well because uh, the site looks great. But when you go to the, the 99 Ways to Get Involved, there's, I, I guess, I'm, I'm imagining at least 99 ways on there that people... The ninety-nine percenters 
can help the service members. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So our website is was designed, um, developed, and is managed by our Director of Communications and Advancement, Shane Cook, and he is absolutely phenomenal. You can tell by the work that he has up on our website. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he, he really, he came in about a year and a half ago and totally just revamped our brand and, and just made it shine out. Um, and our if you go on our website, you can find the nine, you want nine ways through our education and engagement tab, through our program tab. And it basically has, and there is more than 99 ways, but there's at least 99. And we, we picked that number, paralleled it to, you know, the 99% of the civilian population, population, oh, nice. which is what I mentioned earlier. And you can go on, you can, you know, click on, there's a bunch of different boxes you can click on if you're interested in animals, if you're interested in um, homelessness or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, it's tailored so that you can go through a couple of questions and see, this is my skill set, this is my interest. And then it pops up with some suggestions of, of organizations that we know of that are doing great work that we could connect you to, to volunteer. And it gives you the information on how to do that. Uh, and, you know, going one step further, we could, you know, if you don't want to do it through the website or if you don't find what you're looking for, you can always contact someone at Code of Support and we can make that connection for you. That's great. And, and that, that's been, that was really the first effort beyond our, our events that really gave people and a tangible way to do something. So again, you know, we're not just doing a call to action where we're giving um, people the tools and empowering them to do it based on what their other interests are. Yeah, I was clicking through a couple of these and uh, there, there's a lot of these, well, many of them that uh, I never would have thought of. Like uh, I went into the animals section and there's guardian angels for soldiers' pets, foster a pet while a soldier is training or deployed. And that's something that you don't normally think about. Like when soldiers deploy, they have to have a uh, an action plan ready for their children. You know, this is... This is what's going to happen to my children when I deploy. But, you know, there's many service members that that have pets and I never thought about that. Where do they go when somebody deploys? Yeah, it it's it's actually amazing how many organizations are out there doing great work and pe- that people just don't know about that they don't know it's a need so they don't know to even look for it initially. And so that that really provides them a way to not only get involved, but also get to get educated about what's going on. I couldn't have said that better myself. That's the whole reason that I started this podcast is I started learning about all of these amazing organizations. And I realized that, you know, after being in the army for 10 years and being in the Department of Defense for another 15 years, you know, I still am barely scratching the surface of the uh, VSOs that are out there. And so for most Mm -hmm. other veterans who aren't in the VSO community, they probably, you know, the only way that they hear about an organization like this is by hearing a commercial or a buddy telling them about it. Yeah. Well, and you know, I can't tell you how frustrated I get with the fact that transitioning service members really just aren't equipped with, with the resources, the knowledge of the resources, the vast amount of support from organizations that is out there. Um, so, because, you know, they get out, they're excited. They, you know, community organizations really don't, aren't able to have much present presence in the transition of assistance programs. And they get out, they, they say hello, they hug their families and they start their life. And you know, right. we find that 70% are able to transition out just fine. But there's a 30% um, that really, as they're transitioning out, they start, they, they do face some sort of financial instabilities, familial and relational turbulence, health concerns, uh, lack of employment or other challenges related to the transition from the military to the civilian lifestyle. And so that really um, kind of introduces what led us to our second program, which is really has become our primary focus, which is case coordination. And so we, we work with service members, veterans, and their family members to, to get them connected uh, to the services they need. I mean, and our mission statement reads, to engage and leverage the full spectrum of this nation's resources to ensure that our service members, veterans, and their families receive the support that they need and have earned through their service and sacrifice. Um, and our vision is that civilian America, military America, and support organizations come together to ensure that our service members, veterans, and their families share in that quality of life that they have earned. And so 
you know, it's not uncommon at all for some, for most people, uh, service member or civilian, to not have a clue of some of the resources that are out there. And and like you said, you know, a lot of times you'll see it on TV. The ones that there's just there's only really a handful that right. that have the bulletin boards up and that have the the TV. But I would say that the most powerful method of spreading the word is really through uh, veteran network, just just social network. Really, that is primarily where we get most of our cases is word of mouth. Right, right. The more people that we can get the word out to, the better. Mm -hmm. And I I really like uh, the wording in there, how you use the, what was that you said about the vast resources? The vast amount of resources. Right, Mm -hmm. right. You're not just looking at, you know, a service member getting out and, well, you have the VA, you know, you can always go to the VA and the VA is not one-stop shopping for all of a soldier, you know, everything a soldier needs. There's so many more organizations like Code of Support Foundation out there that, that can help a soldier. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we got to get the word and, out. You know, less, less than half of the veterans eligible for the VA are actually enrolled and receiving services or benefits. And, you know, even if tomorrow every single veteran that was eligible went in um, and knocked on the VA's door and, and started to enroll and and just being real here, they don't have the capacity uh, to assist all the veterans with their various needs. I mean, they're able to provide health care. They have some mental health services. They have some great, great programs, um, you know, through their different vet centers. Right. Uh, But, but they, the, the type of support that uh, community organizations can provide, whether it be financial assistance, uh, education support, employment, um, employment assistance, um, mental health, free mental health for family members. They, they really can complement the work that the VA is doing. And, and that's really the core focus of what is case coordination. It's, it's ensuring that they, that veterans and their families get the wraparound support they need. So when, when a veteran <clears throat> walks through our doors, they often have more than one need. They might say they need financial assistance, but there's a deeper issue there. It might, might have to do with mental health. It might have to do with education. And so we typically are calling upwards to 15 organizations before we find it, some organizations that, that this veteran is actually eligible for. And our average is three to five organizations per case is needed to to make sure that that wow. background assistance um, is reached. So uh, let me let me talk about some of the projects that Code of Support Foundation has been involved with in the past. I know about the the one that I was at with when we got to perform an excerpt of the Telling Project for uh, Baltimore Telling, and uh, that was in Washington D.C. and that was a really fun event. But uh, I'd like to hear about some more of the projects that uh, you guys have done. Yeah. So um, just to give you a little background, obviously, you know what happened on, on August 10th this past year was our annual Spirit of 45 event, which is a congressionally mandated um, holiday now to, to commemorate the the end of World War II. And we, we had a big event at the World War II Memorial. Mm-hmm. We had the Veteran Artist Program perform. We had songs from the West Point Alumni, Alumni Glee Club. We had speeches from from different uh, middle school children talking about how they could they could get more involved. And then we also worked with uh, Green Living Technologies to actually create a living wall memorial uh, vertical wall uh, with flowers donated from the Home Depot Foundation. Uh, to actually build a, a living wall memorial to welcome home our post 9-11 veterans. And and that, that wall was actually in uh, the Women in Military Service for America Memorial at Arlington Cemetery through February. And so um, I can kind of talk about the second event that we ran with that with that wall, uh, we had to switch the flowers from outdoor flowers, the pretty purples that we had to some indoor flowers. And so what we ended up doing is Re- re-commemorating the wall to all of the the women veterans that have the 160 that have that have been um have died from the post 9-11 wars and we had a, a service with and this was on 9-11 we had a service with some gold star families uh, and and a, um, several other supporters uh focused towards the women's veterans organizations and and uh we we had each pot had the story tacked on of each of the women that had died and 
we had everyone. And, and then at the end, the Gold Star families actually carry their own daughter's pot up and place it into the wall. Wow. And, and that, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. And then it was, it was a really powerful day. And it, it just was every single person that was there had a pot in their hands. They read the story and they thought about that woman and, and what she had done for our country before they place it into the wall. And, and that was standing there with descriptions on the outside and pictures of all 160 women, like I said, through February. That's, that's giving me chills just hearing about it. it it's giving me chills telling you about it, to it's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I was also pretty moved by the Rosie the Riveters. Yeah. So that was, that was part of our Spirit of 45 event, which we will be having another event this, this Spirit of 45, again, I think it's going to be August 6th this time. It's going to be a kiss off uh, to sign the code and seal it with a kiss. And we're going to see how many people we can get to reenact the 1945 uh, famous kiss scene. Oh, cool. But anyways, to go back to the Rosie, the Riveters. So our, our theme for last year's Spirit of 45 was taking um, the cultural um, expectation and theme of of the greatest generation, that, that idea of service and sacrifice and, and trying to kind of launch it and encourage it and, and motivate our youth uh, to have that with our, in today's world. And so we had some Rosie the Riveters come up, up and speak and tell their story of, of what it was like during World War II and, and what they did and the service that they provided for their country on the home front. Um, and then we tied that in with, uh, with the youth that had had an essay competition and then they, they wrote what, how they would take service and sacrifice into their generation. So that was kind of our call to action was really towards uh, focused towards the youth for that event. And it, it sounded like they embraced it pretty well. The couple that uh, won, they, when they went up there to read them, that was pretty moving. Yeah. We actually joke that the best speech was given by a 14 year old that day. Um, <laughs> and, and we're actually, we're, we're ta- we're hiring on, uh, someone to focus uh, more specifically on our education and engagement program. And part of that in the next year, we will be developing a youth core that will, that will focus on um, getting the youth more involved in this, in these issues. That is a great idea. Because we had, we had such an outpouring. I mean, I think half the crowd was, was middle schoolers that day, right. which was awesome to see. So do you have any, uh, any future projects coming up? You said that you've got the Spirit of 45. Are there, are there any other big projects? So the biggest project now is, is actually regarding our Warrior Veteran Family Support Network, which I, I touched on briefly earlier. The last year I've been working in conjunction with our case coordination program to develop more formalized working relationships with the organizations that we regularly collaborate on for cases. And, uh, and so we've, we've developed a network of hundreds of organizations offline that we, that we regularly work with, uh, and provide mutual referrals. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but one of the things we make sure to do for our case coordination program is we, we do not refer unless we already know what the eligibility requirements are for that organization, because too often, um, you know, the, these individuals are hearing no when, when they, what they really need is, is some support. Right. And so uh, what we'd like to do, uh, we've be kind of come known in the, the veteran support space as if, if we say no, and we don't know what to do. We just send them to go to support, which is great. I mean, at least they're telling, they're telling these people to go somewhere that can help. And so we do what we can to, to find them what they need. Uh, but that's not, that's not really, um, at some point we'll hit the capacity. We won't, we will kind of hit capacity on that. You know, if we keep having organizations refer to us, we'll hit the point where we can only help so many people. Right. So we started talking uh, mid last year about, okay, how do we scale what we do? How do we take our network and, and replicate it or scale it so that other organizations can do what we do without needing to really um, breach out their own scope? And, and, you know, go too far outside of their own capacity. And so we w- started working with a technology company, Elegant Solutions, based in Charlottesville, Virginia. And we we started design. We I've, that's what I've I pretty much have been instead of working with partners the last six months. I've been sitting at a desk designing a database. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it goes much further than your typical directory. It we 
what we've done is we we've taken all of the resources that we have and that we regularly use, which is, you know, in the hundreds, if not at a thousand at this point, and we've categorized them by the services they offer, by the geographic coverage, by their eligibility requirements and that and including their points of contact and then descriptions of their programs of what they actually do, what we know for a fact they are effectively doing. Uh, and that takes a long time to figure out. I mean, it's it's not just something that you can copy and paste from the website. It takes leveraging them, using them, connecting with them. And, and, and so we've taken that, put it into a directory so that our case coordinators are more effective and are able to, uh, use that to to track resources. And then we've added, we're we're layering in another piece where every time you make a search, you have the option to turn it into a case. So say you say, okay, I need someone that that needs employment resources. They're in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, They have a service related disability and they're post 9-11 veteran. Uh, Hit search, pops up on the map where the client is and where some resources are in that area. And then you have the option to turn it into a case. When you turn it into a case, you can add a little more information about it if you need to. And then you can drag and drop the resources that you are that you think they would be a good fit for over into your case so that you're able to track them and, and make case notes. And it's not a uh, super in-depth case management system. That's not what we're looking to do because a lot of organizations already have that. But it's a way to just mm-hmm. simply and efficiently track and organize the resources that that you are using and that so that you can make some more handoff referrals rather than just think, Oh, I think that organization does this. And so we just finished the beta version of that. Uh, we're, we're currently piloting it with our case coordinators and we're hoping to have that launch with some select partners by fall of, of 2016. And so that's really, uh, I think that's the most exciting project that's happening at Coda Support, but it's not one that most people know about. So you're kind of getting the inside scoop right now. <laughs> Excellent. Don't worry. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds like it's going to be uh, very helpful for you guys to uh, better serve. That's the, that's the hope. Before I get into the final three questions, the scary final three questions, I, I was curious about, I wanted to find out about some of the success stories some of the veterans that your organization has helped? Yeah, sure. That's, I mean, I'd say that the most impact we have is our, in our case coordination program. Uh, I can tell you about one that's actually happened recently that it's still kind of in progress, but it's, uh, it's, it really can paint a picture of, of what we typically do for, for someone that calls. So That'd be great. we had a veteran call us, um, I'm not, I'll say, you know, from Montana, that wasn't the state he called, but just to, you know, make up some, some, actual, some different locations from where he's actually from. Right, right. Uh, he had, he had um, been medically retired in 2013. He was at a 90% disability rating uh, and had a lot of other issues that it had um, come up after the fact so that he needed, he needed to increase his, well, he thought he needed to increase his disability rating uh, even further. He um, he was trying to figure out how to get his GI Bill of benefits transferred to his wife so that she could go back to school. His wife was his primary caregiver, and he was unemployed uh, as well as she was. And he was unemployed because he was a he was a medic for 13 years in the military, had deployed multiple times, you know, seen a lot a lot of combat and a lot of trauma, and he, when he was going to hospitals to apply for the work, mm. they were saying you don't have the leadership. Uh, or the medical experience for this job. And my guess is that is because they were not understanding how to how to translate mm. military skills into civilian terms and military experience. Right. And that's a big problem. Yeah. And then um, he tried to work at, at a different uh, store. I won't say the name was in just their um, loading and unloading area. And he had to end up leaving because it was triggering his PTSD because of the noises in the in the small and just like the small area that he had to work in. And and so he called that he, that all was going on. But he called Code of Support. He heard about it actually from Wounded Warrior Project. They referred him over to us because they were unable to help. And and he said, I have my roof is leaking. My um, my floor is cracked. I need my house reward. He had some, his house was from the 1940s. He had three kids and a wife. So five people living in a two bedroom house and it needed some critical repairs. Uh, 
it, almost to the point where it was getting difficult to live if it rained. Wow. And he said, I don't know who to go to when, you know, I transitioned now a year and a half ago and I, I have no idea what organizations are out there. The only one I knew about was Wounded Warrior Project and they told me to call you. So we immediately got him set up with a subject matter expert in translating translating his skills from military to civilian terms. We got him set up with a veteran service officer through the American Legion to help him um, claim some more, some further benefits and to help him also figure out what was going on with his GI Bill, which he had he had never even heard of a veteran service officer before. Um, so he'd done all of his claims himself. So I'm impressed that he got as far as he did. Oh, wow. Uh, we got him set up with um, a great organization, National Lewis University. They do educational mentoring for for uh, service members or and veterans who are looking, you know, trying to figure out what to do next in terms of their education so that his wife could talk uh, to him there. And then we ended up working, we're, we're currently working with Habitat for Humanity and Operation Homefront to get his, his home repairs done. Um, and the last one, I'm missing one other one, but the last the other one I'm thinking of is we had him talk to our veteran peer navigator for a while just because he was feeling so hopeless and feeling like his service didn't mean anything. And we had, we, you know, we wanted him to know that it did matter and, and that there are people there who, who care about what he did. And, and our veteran peer navigator through talking to him actually figured out that he, he deserved some, it was called combat service related compensation, CRSC and our com, what is it? Combat related special compensation. And and that's basically an extra several hundred a month that he should have been getting that Mm -hmm. that basically the VA owes him thousands of dollars right now because he wasn't getting it. And so he um, we're working with his his uh, AW2 advocate to to get him set up with that as well. Uh, And so, you know, he's we're still in progress. His home is still uh, still needs the repairs, but we're getting there. And, and, you know, he will he will get to a point where his home is stable and his life is stable again. And and we're committed to doing that, Um, not just once, you know, once we get the immediate needs done, but but going forward. That is definitely a success story. That's incredible. All of the different uh, connections that you had to make in order to find him the help that he needed. And it wasn't that the the it, the support wasn't there. It was just that he didn't know how to get to it. Right, right. I'm going to go into the final three questions. This is the three questions that everybody, every VSO that I have on, I'm going to be asking them these same questions. So they're going to sound familiar, but the answers will all be different. <laughs> <laughs> so number one, who would you like to hear on a future episode of Veteran Resource Podcast? Okay, so I was looking and thinking through the answer, and you know, I have so, we have so many great organizations that we work with. So what I ended up doing is is picking like eight of the the areas that we most often need to provide assistance for, and picking um like one of our go to organizations that we use Excellent. for it. Um, so for financial <laughs> assistance, I picked Operation Homefront, uh, legal okay. assistance. Uh, Finnegan Law, volunteering or community engagement, I picked Mission Continues, peer support, Team Red, White, and Blue, education, National Lewis University, mental health, Courage Beyond, housing, Habitat for Humanity, Veterans Build, and employment, Capital Post. And I can definitely uh, make introductions if you if you want to any of those organizations. Absolutely. I'll talk to you about that uh... After, after the show. Sure. Okay. Question number two. What upcoming project has you fired up right now? Um, well, I, I think I mostly answered that question with the Warrior Veteran Family Support Network, but I'm really excited to, to see the impact that that tool can have in this, this space in terms of uh, facilitating collaboration and empowering service providers. And I think once it's launched, the the impact that it could have in the community is exponential. And I should add, it is, and I should have said this earlier, it is the only tool in our space that it de- that is designed by service providers for service providers. So it it's not veteran facing; it's service provider facing. So that when they're working with their client, there really is that no wrong door approach. They're able to refer them to organizations that that 
that they know based on the military service history of their client that that person would and the needs that 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 person would likely be eligible. Yeah, that's going to be a that's going to be a great tool. Okay, time for the the brain stretcher question here. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you woke up tomorrow and you find out that somebody made an anonymous donation of ten million dollars to your organization, what would you like to do with the money? <laughs> so, believe it or not, this is a question that we talk about more often than not at Code of Support. <laughs> nice. And so I, you know, we have to have this answer for a year now because we're always talking about our our executive direct, director, Christy Kaufman. She she always she she's committed to buying a lottery ticket. I think it's once <laughs> a month, just in case, because she can't talk about winning the lottery if she's not at least trying. And she's always going to try. <laughs> Dollar in a dream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, we could we could hire fifty case coordinators, and there would still be a need. So what we would want to mm. do is is to pour the money into a system that makes it better, and not just treat the symptoms. Uh, so I would take that money, and I would want to pour it into our programs and, and infrastructure of code of support, and and really direct a significant portion to that to scaling and building uh, the Warrior Veteran Family Support Network and its virtual platform. Because because that that's the game changer for the space. I mean, not just that specific tool, but but being able to facilitate the coordination and, and navigation of resources for service members and veterans and their families. That is the need. Uh, that you know, yes, we need help with financial assistance and mental health and education and all of those other things. Yes, we need that. That's a need. But the need for the space. To, to actually change the game so that this isn't happening still, you know, whenever our ne- the next war is ending and when service members are transitioning out is to make the, the space more effective. And, and that's really, that's a big goal and a big dream, but, but, but that's the dream and, and, and it has to become a reality at some point. Well, listeners, if any of you out there have an extra $10 million laying around, you heard the amazing good that it could do in the hands of Code of Support. So uh, make sure that you get in touch with them. And that leads me into how would somebody get in touch with you or with your organization? So I think the easiest way to do it is you can definitely just email or call me. Uh, My email is jamie, J-A-M-I-E, at codeofsupport.org. And my office line is 571 Five two seven three two three three, and I would be happy to talk to any supporters looking to get involved in the space, any service members, veterans, or their families that might need assistance, or that also would like to volunteer or get involved with us, and also any sort of other supporters that that want to learn more about Code of Support and what we do. Outstanding! I will be sure to put those in the show notes as well. Thank you, Jamie. This has been an outstanding interview. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for what you do because this podcast and, and, and spreading the word like you're looking to do, that, that makes a huge difference. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot. Code of Support is another one of those great organizations, and I really enjoyed talking to Jamie. You could really tell the passion in her voice that she has when she's talking about helping people through the Code of Support Foundation. I'm going to make sure that I put all of the information about how to get in contact with Jamie and with the Code of Support Foundation in the show notes. And I might even stick the picture of her as a vampire. Haven't decided yet. What do you think? Should I do it? Let me know. You can find the show notes at veteranpodcast.com slash 004. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the Veteran Resource Podcast. We will see you in episode five.